Okay. Well, actually, it's ironic that you said a different title because I added an asterisk, and we'll get to why that asterisk is there in a little bit. Um, I'm Anne-Marie Thomas. I'm here from Minnesota um, at the University of St. Thomas. I didn't choose it just because it shared a name, um, where I run the Playful Learning Lab. Uh, and so this talk, I get to speak, but it's actually my students' work. Uh, they are rock stars, um, and four of them are here with me at, um, at the summit, so I hope you get to meet them. I'll introduce them later in this talk. Um, I've been at the University of St. Thomas for 17 years, minus a one-year leave to help start the Maker Education Initiative. Um, and I'm a professor of engineering um, and also of entrepreneurship, uh, and I lead our engineering education programs. Um, so. I have to stress, though, that our lab, oh, I was going to show pictures. I did a different order, too. Um, what does our lab do? What does it mean to run a lab on play? Um, I'm at a liberal arts undergraduate-focused university in Minnesota. Um, and the Playful Learning Lab is a multidisciplinary lab um, where we've done a variety of projects um, where we really look at the intersection of art, technology, and K-12 education. Um, when I'm looking for projects, I always say, is it good for K-12 teachers and educators? Um, that's the first criteria, and then we'll provide awesome experiences for undergraduates um, because I've over the years gotten great compliments on my grad students and postdocs. I don't have any grad students and postdocs. My lab is entirely undergraduates. Um, so we've done a variety of things. We, we, we'll come back to this one, but squishy circuits, right? How can we, how can we create recipes where people can cheaply create circuits for kids? Um, Coding and music was our Code and Chords project. We've done a lot of work in the circus community on sensors for flying trapeze. Um, and then a lot on how do, we, how do we look at unusual ways of sharing information. Um, one of our closest collaborators the last five years is the rock band OK Go. Um, through OK Go Sandbox, I executive produced their education videos and the content that they've shared through that, including like building stuff for space with kids. Um, and a project we did during the pandemic with 15,000 people, I think some of you helped uh, creating uh, collaborative music videos um, for their All Together Now uh, music video, uh, and a conference that we ran during the pandemic. So it's this, this mix of projects that really our goal has always been, how do we smash things together, and how do we get people who haven't worked together working on things? Um, but man, it's been a little hard to do this in the last four years. We're a very hands-on lab. My, my team is undergrads. Like We have lunch together every week. We travel together heavily. This is our first trip since, uh, as, a, as a group since 2019. It's new undergrads. Um, we, we learned, they've learned, thank you, Maria, learned the hard way about what it's like to fly with a suitcase or TSA full of squishy circuits. Um, we can talk about that later. I'm not allowed to carry the suitcase. I can tell you that story later, too, if my students take turns. Um, because this is an undergraduate lab. Um, and these are typically 10 to 30 students. They're all paid. I don't take volunteers because it's an equity issue. So we scramble to find the grants, and then they're all paid. Um, and they cover about 12 different majors. Um, and the faculty that leads the team are volunteers. Um, so this, is, this has been going on for a while now. But these are the rock stars of this project. Um, but man, again, it's, it's been a hard couple of years. So it was really exciting uh, when the call came out for the Oshawa Academic Trailblazers Fellowship. Um, thank you to both Ashwa and to the Sloan Foundation uh, for a chance to really look at what does it mean to do open source hardware in academia and how do we help people do that. Um, so we came up with two questions that we were going to look at as this, as this fellowship project. First, how and where is open source hardware used in K-12 education? Uh, and then the second is what are examples of paths that led from academic projects becoming companies or external projects? So how do open source hardware projects leave a lab? It looked really good on paper. Thank you to everyone who read it. Like this was our goal plan for the year. Um, you'll see it went a little differently. So as an academic um, and looking at this as a, you know, the goals of this fellowship, part of it is, well, how do we make sure that particularly junior faculty, I fully aware that I'm a tenured full professor in business and engineering. It's a very different position than if you are pre-tenure trying to have this work count. So what we really wanted to look at is, where can we find examples of open source hardware in K-12 education as evidence through published peer-reviewed li literature? Um, and we broke this into four areas. We, we said, you know, how is it being used in elementary school, middle school, high school, and extracurricular programs? These are all very different. Um, and we picked six areas to look at, um, an amazing team of undergraduates. We had one group looking at laboratory equipment. So thank you to, uh, to the lab from, <clears throat> my news lab from Stanford, um, right? There's tons on Foldoscope and some of the great projects out of there. We can't wait to hear tomorrow about their work, the new work. Uh, circuit exploration, right? Lots of awesome open source circuit projects. Music technology, physical computing, 3D printing, robotics. You know, we will be looking at Carlotta's work. How do we, how do we find evidence of this? And then share it to show that it's had impact, 
Right. And that is such a challenging word in academia, um, but really looking again at what's where are things being published. Um, so lots and lots of lit review. This is a work in progress. Um, Katie is who's sitting in the audience there. She's got a spreadsheet with hundreds of papers that they've been they've been categorizing. Um, and we have some drafts of lit reviews that are going. Thank you, Maria and Megan and Cameron and Katie and so many, so many students. Um, so that's one project we currently have going. The other um, is my business professor hat. Um, if you've been to business school, um, I teach in an entrepreneurship program, you read a lot of case studies. Very few of the case studies look at open source hardware. Um, and so my dream is when I'm teaching my undergraduate tech prototyping classes, I want some case studies that show the awesome projects that are being done in this community and how they've been brought to people. Um, so to actually get to the point where we have these case studies and we have teaching notes. Um, so the easiest one and the one I, I should talk about a little bit that we're writing um, is squishy circuits. Um, if you have any of you ever seen squishy circuits, if you haven't, we have them at the table in the back. Squishy circuits started because as the maker movement was really taking off, I was a mom and I wanted my kids to have something to do while I was like cooking dinner and I thought it would be fun for them to do circuits, but she was a little young to really do e-textiles. Um, so we looked and we came up with these recipes and this was truly like no goal for this project. I just wanted something fun I could do with teachers. We shared it on a website. I was very aware that I was pre-tenure, so we also found ways to publish it and have other people cite it. Um, and that was all really lovely. Um, and then I had a chance to give a talk that kind of exploded. If you are a professor at a primarily undergraduate university running a lab that you don't even really have space for, and you're teaching about six classes a year, um, we didn't kind of know how to handle all these people emailing us. So my awesome undergrads at the time were answering all the emails. And we shared all our recipes, and we answered the emails, and we changed the recipes if someone was gluten-free, and we showed what parts to buy. Um, and I was very proud of ourself. And then it was pointed out to me by one of my students that if, if I was a teacher, I probably didn't want to have to solder all the battery packs myself. And so, Henry, we should start a, we should start a way of selling this, too, for people still share the plans, but we have to have a company. Um, and pre-tenure, two kids wasn't going to start a company. Um, so going through that process of if you're at a university that doesn't really have a tech transfer office, how do you do this? Well, you have an awesome undergraduate take it on. You make sure that you give the train the trademark over to them. Um, and Matt Schmidtbauer, who started this as an undergrad, then worked his way through and, and actually has Squishy Circuits store now, um, which is still in existence a decade plus later. Um, so this is a case study that we are writing up and we'll be happy to share with you all. So yeah, Maria is lead author for this one. Um, but here's the asterisk. Um, here's the second talk I get to give today. So those are the projects that we're doing. Um, and if you're an academic, you've probably written some grant proposals and this is our plans and we are gonna do this this month and this this month and this the next month. And we have three rules in our lab and we take these very seriously and actually most of my students can cite them. Um, the first is be kind, the second is play well with others, and the third is clean up your messes, uh, which sometimes is literal like getting paint off of walls, but usually is apologies or figuring out what went wrong and fixing it. And Prepping for this talk, as, as I was putting this together, I realized that the last time I was here um, was nine years ago in 2015. It's a good thing I checked because that was actually the dress I was gonna wear today and I thought that was like too spot on. It's like, okay, so this same dress, different color. Um, but I had this slide, I'd given the keynote that year and I was talking about a book I'd written on the maker movement where I'd interviewed dozens of makers um, about their childhoods and looking for, for trends. And one of the slides from that talk, like just taken you know, from the Oshawa website, is that makers share. They don't just share the happy, successful stuff, they share the struggles. So I was debating as I gave this talk, I'm like, we could, I could have shown you pretty slides. You guys saw a bunch of Google Docs of where we currently are with these papers, and I'm in awe of the other trailblazers and all that they've accomplished this year. My team is awesome, but um, what makes open hardware exciting to me is this community and the fact that we we have we've seen, you know, this morning the beauty of personal computers and how that depends on who's making it and who they're talking to and who's helping them and the story of Noise Bridge and being taught how to use the laser cutter and materials recommended. Um, so my turn to be honest, you know, what does it mean to be a trailblazer in academia? Um, I often ask my students, like, how they know what their professors do. And if, they look, if you look at a website or you look at a curriculum vitae, CV of a professor, you see the, the successes. You see the grants won. There'll be a line for Oshawa Trailblazer, right? That's a grant in front of awesome students. But we don't always share the, these are the things that really didn't work. Um, or this is the paper we didn't write. And so I want to stress, um, as I present work with my students, that Man, one of the things about being an academic right now is that you're also being an academic in 2023, 
a human in 2023 and in many of our cases, a parent in 2023. And it's amazing how the grants we might have written prior to the beginning of COVID, it has changed. What it means to be doing anything in academia right now is rather different, um, but I think also open source hardware. And so I point this out because we realize as someone who works with K-12, our US and actually global uh, academic system is exhausted. Um, if you're looking at the rates of teacher burnout and teachers, and that those are the students that are coming to us. Um, if you look at the current undergrads, you guys are amazing. I love my students, they're here. But let's be honest, they are also the students who probably had one or more years where they were remote and maybe didn't have some of their classes. Um, and so I, I wanna call attention to this because honestly, I when I wrote that proposal, I said we'd have these papers published by now. We don't, that's on me, um, because it's been, a, it's been a really interesting time to think about what does it mean to be part of a community, be it open source, you know, be it academia. Um, and again, I can say this with the privilege of being a tenured professor, but I can't imagine if I am starting out and trying to write these papers and get things started. Um, so I point this out because I, I, I don't wanna say like, we wrote this proposal and everything went great and we're done. Um, the work's going well, and thank you so much for Ashba and to the Sloan Foundation. Um, but I'll be honest that we've, I, we, we haven't finished our project. It is a work in progress, right? So if we look at how and where is open source hardware used in K-12 education, and what are the case studies we can use, they're a work in progress. Um, and I'm honestly kind of happy about that's where it is, because I always tell my students their health and family comes first, then school, whatever that means to them, um, and then the work of our lab. And to me, that has to be third, because to do work that is personal and that we're going to share, we also have to acknowledge that, I don't know, has anyone had an easy couple of years, right? So, I mean, my four students have had so many meetings skipped with me and my I've been sick and other people. But I think that's one of the things I wanted to acknowledge when I was putting this together is if, if part of what we are is community, um, I, and to be a trailblazer, I don't wanna come up here and say, here's the awesome work that we've done and all the things, like we've done some good stuff. But I think the most important part is we're relearning how systems function in this pandemic society and after the trauma of the last couple of years. Um, and I am so ridiculously proud of my students who are doing all of this work while also juggling um, all of the myriad issues that, that we know that people are dealing with, particularly if you are a student. Uh, we were supposed to go to a conference last month and then there was a shooting at that campus, right? So that's a lot if you're working with undergraduates and for me, the community aspect is always going to come first. And so we are super excited that Ashwa is letting us, you know, we, we've been going slow, so we'll, we'll get that work done. It's still there. I'm happy to share the drafts. We have file upon file um, in progress. We hope to get these out this summer, assuming everyone's healthy and happy and we get there. Um, but I just wanted to, to say that I think to us, that's our strength, right? All of us as a community, the sharing and already hearing in the co coffee hours that people sharing what sources they have or the stories of, you know, which board one should be using, um, lean on that. Like if we go back to the idea of open source and sharing, uh, I think there's also the acknowledging sometimes that not everything works out the way we wanted them to. Um, so again, thank you guys so much for, for having our team here. Um, we have four undergrads who are traveling with us on this work. We have Maria, who's an entrepreneurship student. We have Katie from mechanical engineering. We have Maria, who is, sorry, Megan. We have Megan, who's biology, and Cameron's at a workshop. He's my comp, one of our comp sci students. Um, but part of what we're hoping is that by exposing the next generation of potential graduate students for folks like Jonathan and others to this community early, um, that we, we, we start building that out. So thank you guys.